underground phenomena. Aerial mapping techniques were used to measure the apparent crater for comparison at a later date with dimensions of the true crater. From aerial stereographs, the depth of the apparent crater was computed at 90 feet, the maximum lip height at 19 feet, and the radius at 146 feet. The radius was less than expected. These results indicate that the charge depth does not appreciably increase crater radius, although the volume of material displaced is greater. An analysis of the data from the jangle and the teapot underground shots of identical yield leads to the conclusion that there is no significant change in cratering TNT efficiency over the range of charge depths from 17 to 67 feet for a yield of 1.2 kilotons. South of the underground testing area is Yucca Flat, location of Hornet, a 300-foot tower shot. Although Hornet was a development shot, a military effects study was made to evaluate the attenuating factor of a ground smoke screen against thermal radiation. As expected, it was found that a 75 to 90 percent attenuation resulted in areas where the fog oil smoke was heaviest. Out on Frenchman Flat, however, the teapot schedule called for the most extensive military effects test of the series, coded as the Met shot. A tower shot of 28 kilotons expected yield, 400 feet above the dry lake, MET involved the greatest number of projects in two important objectives. First, destructive loads on aircraft in flight, wherein three drone jet aircraft were timed to be directly above ground zero at shock arrival time. And second, a study of the behavior of blast waves along different types of ground surfaces, particularly to obtain more information about precursor phenomena. Several low nuclear bursts on prior Nevada tests had revealed the existence of a precursor or non-ideal blast wave that preceded the main shock front. Shot 10 of upshot knothole formed such a wave and drag type targets were damaged much more heavily than by similar overpressures from shot 9 which had an ideal wave form. For example, on upshot knothole, jeeps were exposed in both shots 9 and 10 to overpressures of approximately 9 psi. On shot 9, only moderate damage. On shot 10, a low burst, the damage was extremely severe, in many cases completely demolishing the vehicles at the same overpressure that produced moderate damage on shot 9, a high burst. Dynamic pressures were much higher for the low burst which produced a dust-laden precursor blast wave. Was dust an important factor? Did the precursor increase the damage effectiveness of a low burst? Would a low precursor forming burst be more effective than a surface burst? What effect did the characteristics of the ground surface have on the effects of a low burst? Answers to these questions were important objectives of the MET shot. The area layout of MET called for three types of surfaces the desert or dusty precursor forming surface, the asphalt or non-dusty precursor forming surface which would absorb thermal radiation, the water or non-dusty non-precursor forming surface which would reflect thermal radiation. North of the tower was the water blast line, a shallow artificial lake 800 feet wide and 3,000 feet long which was flooded with several inches of water just before H hour. Towards the south was the asphalt blast line, a smooth surface rolled flat upon the ground and also 800 by 3,000 feet in dimensions. To the west, the usual normally dusty desert surface of Frenchman Flat. Much of the instrumentation was duplicated along all three lines in order to correlate the results. Pitot tubes to measure the dynamic pressures. Pitch gauges to determine the vertical change and direction of particle motion versus time and distance. Snob gauges to measure the dynamic pressure of the air alone in the presence of dust. Density gauges to measure the density of air and dust and to determine blast effects on objects of varying shapes. Spheres, cylinders, and force plates were set up at instrument stations. Throughout the MET test area, each instrument was ready to catch a specific clue that would aid in solving the problem of the precursor. What was the quantity and size of the dust particles carried by the shock wave? Dust samplers and beta densitometers would get the answers. Along the three blast lines, 
jeeps as drag type targets sensitive to dust loading were parked at various orientations at predetermined distances from ground zero. Likewise, drag type structural elements and simple shapes were positioned. Some were concrete cubicles with instrumentation mounted on them. Some were old upshot knothole structures such as the bridge members and trusses, water tanks of welded and riveted construction, and several of the existing test structures. Some structures were covered with three feet of earth to evaluate such protection from a blast wave estimated at 17 PSI overpressure and 120 PSI dynamic pressure. A special study of the effects of positive phase duration was begun on this shot. Two sets of buildings were erected of steel frames with two different types of wall paneling. Theory predicts that as positive phase duration is increased, the peak pressure required to cause a given level of damage is decreased for certain target types. In order to obtain positive phase durations differing by as much as 10 to 1, two shots are required for the study. One with a nominal yield in the kiloton range and the second in the megaton range. For example, the teapot buildings were to be exposed to a positive shock phase duration of less than one second at 3 to 7 PSI, while later in the Pacific, it is planned that duplicates of these same buildings are to be exposed to a large yield positive phase duration of five to eight seconds at lower overpressures. Since the water blast line afforded the possibility of a clear or ideal shock wave with classical free air characteristics, a study was set up to determine the structural response of fighter aircraft horizontal stabilizers. Six F-80 and three F-86D stabilizers were mounted vertically at a high angle of attack to obtain lethal gust loading. Rounding out the blast program were miscellaneous projects concerned with military equipment, field type fortifications, machine gun emplacements, dugouts, and trenches. Since the drone program required daylight for operating purposes, MET had the further distinction of being the first daytime tower shot ever fired at the Nevada test site. While the expected yield was 28 kilotons, radiochemical analysis indicated a yield closer to 22 kilotons. The results of the surface blast program on the MET shot turned out to be largely as expected. A pronounced precursor formed over the asphalt line due to the high absorption of thermal radiation. The strong precursor effects extended over a greater distance than over the desert blast line. In general, the greatest drag force was measured on the desert line where dust density was greatest. Dust loading of the blast wave apparently contributed to the high total force instrument readings. Actual existence of the high total force was qualitatively confer confirmed by jeep damage, which was much greater than on the asphalt line. On the water line, blast perturbations were observed within 2,500 feet of zero and jeep damage in this area was greater than on the asphalt line. Essentially, ideal shock forms were observed over the water in the next 500 feet where the aircraft components were located. F-80 stabilizer damage was greater than expected, varying from complete destruction at the inner range to moderate damage at the outer range. However, the F-86D components received overpressures as high as 12 PSI with no visible damage good data on high-level elastic loads were obtained. A project that aroused high interest on MET concerned nuclear fireball lethality to basic missile structures and ceramic materials. Light television towers were used to mount 10-inch solid steel and aluminum spheres, hollow steel cylinders, and aluminum spheres with ceramic inserts. Specimens were also placed in the shot cab. The first tower was only 60 feet from the shot tower, with four others erected close behind in a descending pattern. Although it was anticipated that most specimens would be lost, all except those in the cab were recovered. Observations indicate the greatest metal loss was 1.15 inches on the radius of the closest aluminum sphere. Out along the water blast line, several stations had samples of ceramics exposed to evaluate thermal shock resistance. At a remote station on the desert line, a parabolic mirror was set up to concentrate radiant energy on ceramic specimens. Post-shot visual examination revealed severe glazing from the high thermal flux.
cloud growth studies were made throughout the